In this episode, we're going to get back to the technical end of it. And at the end, towards the end of this episode, I will demonstrate how to produce electricity with a chemical reaction. It'll be a hands-on demonstration that I'm going to do right in front of you with a lemon and two December metals and something to measure the voltage. To begin with, we're going to be talking more about atoms and electrons. Now, if you look at this battery right here, this is a cell, a single cell. It's not really a battery, but it's a dry cell. It has a positive and a negative terminal. There is an electrostatic field right now that goes between minus and plus. It's all around it. And if I actually take something with a battery in it and turn it on, now I have an a electrostatic field and an EMF electromagnetic field all the way around the flashlight. You can't see it, but it's there. And it can be measured with an instrument external to the flashlight. Now this flashlight's metal, so it probably is going to act like a shield to keep the field inside the metal flashlight. When they graphically represent that field, whether it's electrostatic or electromagnetic, they, they draw it with lines. So they'll show you like a battery, they'll have lines going from one end to the other that get bigger and bigger as they go out. And that's to represent the field. There are no lines, but they call them lines of flux. That's a word used for uh, these invisible fields that are around everything electric. So right now, you are sitting in a magnetic field, electrostatic field. If there's anything electricity around you, refrigerator, TV, computer, you know, if you're walking down the street and there's power lines up there and there's electricity flowing, you're in that field. You're in the field all the time. So in the drawings you'll see in this episode, when they show an electron, then they show lines going out from it. That's to represent the field around it. Uh, this gets a little bit more technical. Uh, don't get too wound up in it. Learn what you can, and then at the end of it, uh, you'll watch the little thing with, you know, making a battery out of a lemon and copper and steel with some explanation. And then we're going to go back and do another in the episode after this. We'll go back to Tinkercad. Let's do it. However, just for grins, smiles, before we get into that, I want to show you a little video of what happens when you increase the voltage, the electrostatic pressure high enough. So remember, there's a field that exists between plus and minus, between two electrical wires. And if you get the wires close enough, they'll arc without even touching. Now, it takes a fairly high voltage to do that. With your wall outlet at home, eh, probably not. You'll have them so close you'll think they're touching when they arc. Don't do it. You're not able to put an eye out or kill yourself. But I'm going to play a video to show you what happens when you have really high voltage, thousands of volts, thousands of volts, and you have air between the two polarities, that electrostatic pressure is so intense pulling on the, uh, the hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen atoms in the air is trying to pull the electrons this way and the protons this way. And if it gets high enough, it will rip all the molecules in the atmosphere apart and you'll get conduction and you'll get an arc. And I mean a serious arc. So just keep that in mind when you're watching this little video clip. Then we'll get into the stuff that's not as exciting, but it might explain what you just saw in the little video.
This older gentleman here, Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev, is basically credited for the periodic table. And we give a date here of 1869. This is just to give you a chronological reference. And the idea of the periodic table evolved because it was discovered that not all atoms are alike. Everything is made of molecules and molecules are made up of atoms, but not all atoms are alike. For instance, H2O, water, two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. Oxygen is a heavier material, has more components in its nucle nucleus and more electrons orbiting the nucleus. So not all atoms are alike. This periodic table really is the work of more than just this gentleman. There were hundreds of scientists that really contributed to this periodic table. And the reason they call it a periodic table is because they have arranged them to show the periodic similarity as you go through from the lightest, which is helium, um, the hydrogen, the lightest, which is hydrogen, to the heaviest, which is down in the lower right-hand corner. So it goes from the upper left-hand corner across to the lower right-hand corner. And so the they pick this number of columns because as you go through the elements from the lightest to the heaviest, periodically one of them displays similar characteristics to one of them earlier in the list. So if you look at hydrogen, it's yellow. And then right underneath you have a column of green, then blue, then you have a number of columns of orange, then you have red, yellow, cyan, and back to blue. Of interest to us, because we're you know, talking about basic electricity, are copper, silver, and gold, Cu, Ag, and Au. Copper is the lightest of the three, silver is medium weight, and gold, of course, is the heaviest. Everybody knows gold's heavy. What is similar about these three is that each of them, in their outer electron orbit, called the valence ring, have only one electron in that outer orbit, and it's loosely attached to the atom, which means it's easily stripped off for the movement of electrons, hence they're called conductors. Another vertical column here would be silicon, germanium, and selenium. These are three elements used to make semiconductors, and of course silicon now is the most dominant of those. So the periodic table here is more than just a list of elements. Conductors and insulators are extremely important to our understanding of basic electricity. If you want to control the movement caused by applying an electromotive force, you need to have influences that oppose it going where you don't want it to go, and you have to provide a path for it to go where you want it to go. It's something like digging a ditch to drain a pond. You dig the ditch to get the water to go where you want it to go. So the size of the ditch would be an insulator and the depth and altitude of the bottom of the ditch would be the conductor, so to speak. So uh, a brief examination of the apparent structure of atoms will assist in your understanding of both insulators and conductors. Atoms are proposed to be made up of a nucleus around which electrons travel in orbits of defined distance. And each level of orbit contains a definitive quantity of electrons. The outermost orbit level is referred to as the valence level or valence ring. If the particular element, such as copper, the one that we're most interested in as a conductor, happens to have only one electron in its outer orbit, it is classified as a conductor. As the quantity of electrons in the outer orbit increases, they are more tightly bound to the nucleus. So an element like silicone, which has four electrons in its outer orbit, is classified as a semiconductor or an insulator. And copper, which has only one electron in the outer orbit, is classified as a conductor because that lone electron is not tightly bound to the nucleus. So we'll look a little deeper at the conductive properties. Niels Bohr introduced this model of an atom back in the early 1900s. 
and I want to say at this point, and I will probably repeat myself a couple more times, no human being has ever seen an atom. That is to say, no human being has ever had the image of an atom focused on the, his retina, whether it be from a lens microscope. The reason that they say they can see atoms with an electron microscope is basically they throw energy at an element and then they look at the reaction and determine what they're looking at from the reactions. Kind of like reaching your hand into a dark hole where you can't see anything and then moving your hand around in there to see what happens. You And you can feel with your hand, you say, oh, okay, this feels like this, this feels like that. Therefore, what's in there must be a dog because when I pet it, it I can feel it wiggling, so it must be wagging its tail. So if you've never seen a dog before, you really have a hard time reaching in a dark hole, feeling something warm and furry and petting it and saying it was a dog. So remember, no human being has ever seen an atom before. So this model that you're looking at here, the Bohr model, represents a nucleus, which is to represent the bulk of the mass. And a nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. Orbiting around the nucleus are a number of electrons equal to the number of protons in the nucleus. A proton is positive, you see the nucleus there, plus 29, and then there should be 29 negative electrons. And those electrons have energy and if they did, had no energy at all, then the electrons would collapse into the nucleus and the two charges, the two electrostatic charges would come completely together, then cancel the field. So the electrons actually have energy and they're trying to move away from the nucleus, but the positive charge in the nucleus is holding the electrons from going out any further than what is shown here. This is a little bit different model of an atom, but it's still, a, it's still a Bohr model, just has a little dimension to it. This is a newer graphic showing the Bohr model, and the valence electron is emphasized as a light green ring. So that is the valence electron or the electron that can easily be freed up if you apply a force. Now that force doesn't have to be magnetic or electrostatic. It can be thermal. If you heat up this atom, the electrons become more agitated and this free electron will fly completely out of its orbit and then drop back in. So they call that thermal emission. So almost all objects have some thermal activity even at room temperature. At some point we've all played with magnets whether it was the magnets on the refrigerator or we paid particular attention to them in science class or magnetic things that we come across in our daily lives and we stop and play with them for a minute. <clears throat> well, what is magnetism? At the heart of magnetism is the electron. The electron is presumed to have a magnetic polarity just like the earth and the electron has a spin like the earth spins as it orbits around the earth the electrons spin as they orbit around the nucleus if you've played with enough magnets you know that depending on how you hold them against each other in one direction they attract and hold tight to the, together in the other direction they repel so every atom has electrons. Every electron has a magnetic field as seen here. And by the way, they show the magnetic field as lines. The lines are only to depict that there is a magnetic field there. And if it's comparative, then between one object and another, the denser the lines, the stronger the magnetic field. But theoretically, these lines of force or flux as they call it magnetic field actually extends out indefinitely 
So if you took two of these electrons and they were facing opposite directions, in other words, their spins were in the opposite direction as you see here, the spin of the electron determines the polarity. And if you look at those magnetic lines of force and look at the direction of the arrows, you'll see that the lines leaving the north pole on the one on the right are traveling in the same direction as those going into the south pole on the electron on the left. So these two magnetic fields cancel each other out completely. So although every electron has a magnetic field, in almost all atoms, the net magnetic field is zero because the electrons balance each other out. However, in one material in particular, and that's iron, and we refer to it as ferromagnetic material, the way the electrons are orbiting around the nucleus, they don't all cancel out. So every atom of a ferromagnetic material has a net magnetic field. Remember all other materials have zero magnetic field because their individual magnetic fields equal and they're flipped in opposite directions and they cancel. Only in ferromagnetic material do all of the atoms have net magnetic field. However, if you take two ferromagnetic atoms and place them next to each other in opposite directions, then they too cancel each other out. So iron or ferromagnetic material like steel, nail, screwdriver, blade, etc., they are ferromagnetic material, but because their atoms, which make up their molecules, are arranged in random directions, you get a net balance of zero for the magnetic field. So if you've ever, ever made a magnet, meaning you've actually magnetized a piece of iron or steel, this is how you probably did it. You wrapped some electrical conductor around a nail or a screwdriver blade, and then you touch the two ends of the wire to a battery. And as current flows through that conductor, the electrons flowing through the conductor, since they're all going in the same direction, their magnetic field joins together to make a very intense magnetic field inside of that coil. And inside of that coil was that nail or that screwdriver blade. That forces the, the molecules in the ferromagnetic material called domains or dipoles, meaning two poles, it forces them all to line up in the same direction. And then when you remove the magnetic field created by the wire wrapped around it, not all of them go back into random order. So it's left with a net magnetic field and now you have a permanent magnet. Now in manufacturing, when they make a permanent magnet, they take ferromagnetic material in a semi-molten state. In other words, it's not quite liquid yet. It's still a solid, but it's very, very malleable. You know, it's red hot and just below the temperature for making it, you know, melt into a liquid. They place it inside of a really strong electromagnetic field, you know, created by electricity flowing through a coil. And they, by a conveyor, it goes into that field and the magnetic force from the coil with the electricity running through it forces all of these domains, the ferromagnetic material molecules, it forces them all to line up with all their north poles in one direction, south poles in the opposite. At that point, it is a very powerful magnet. And then while it's still hot and being magnetized, they quench it with water. And so as the metal hardens again, all of the domains or dipoles are all lined up in the same direction and now you have a really powerful permanent magnet. So when you go back to this picture, you can see that the source of magnetism is the electron. Even though we think of a magnet as a bar magnet with the north and the south pole, it actually comes from the electrons that have not completely randomly balanced each other out to a net zero magnetic field, but instead they have a net magnetic field. This is a no-brainer. Opposite forces attract, like forces repel. And this is evident in nature as well as in physics. Physics is actually 
kind of a contraction for physical philosophy. So physics, the study of physics, the science of physics is physical philosophy. philosophy. So opposite forces attract like north and south poles, like forces repel. And this goes for positive and negative. Positive repels positive, positive attracts negative. Okay, here's two charges. And we're just gonna further emphasize what we've been saying. Notice that the lines of force emanating out from these charges, one negative, one positive, are traveling in opposite directions. So if you place two like forces next to each other, as seen here on the left, their lines of force or their flux joins together and draws the two objects closer and closer together. So the lines of force are always seeking to be as short as possible. So in this case, this negative and positive charge would come together and then the magnetic field would cancel out. The force is still there, but it's canceled out because it is trapped between the two. Now, put this in your mind for pondering. Let's say that you took this positive force and this negative force or this positively charged object and negatively charged object. They're also called ions. And you put them near each other, but you did not allow any means for them to come closer together. In other words, let's say you put an insulator between the two, then they would hold the state that you see right here and there would be a strong electrostatic field between these two charges but they're kept from coming together and canceling by the insulator that's placed between them. Over on the right side, you see two positive charges. Their lines of flux or force lines, because they're traveling in the same direction, cannot connect and join together. So you, when you try to push two like forces together, the fields aren't compatible and they can't cross each other. So in other words, you are actually compressing the field from these two objects as you try to force them together. If you have ever taken two really strong permanent magnets and put one in each hand and held them close to your body so you could steady your hands, in other words, like on your stomach or chest and then slide them towards each other, at some point you start feeling the resistance and if you watch, if it's a really strong permanent magnet, you will not be able to push them all the way together. What usually happens is the force becomes, the force of repulsion becomes so strong pushing back against the muscles in your arms that it actually is greater and then your hands slip and it go, they go by each other because the member of the North and South Poles are attracting the same as the two North Poles are repelling, etc. Okay, we've talked about atoms and electrons. This is a copper atom. At least it's a graphical representation of a copper atom. I did not draw this diagram. I pulled this off the web. And you see there's 29 electrons orbiting at different levels around the nucleus. The outermost one is the one that we are most excited about, no pun intended. That is the valence electron or the free electron. So if we look at a copper conductor, which is made up of millions of these atoms, these copper atoms, and each copper atom has a free electron. So we have a very thin density here of copper atoms, but it'll do for our illustration. Now those electrons that have the stars on them, that's the free electron. They are loosely attached to the nucleus. So any energy imposed on this system will cause them to leave their orbit and then pop back in. So if we were to heat up this copper wire, all of these free electrons, the ones with stars on them, would uh, pick up the energy of the heat waves going into the conductor and they would fly off by something called thermal emission, then they would pop back in. Now, electrons are all the same, so it doesn't matter which atom an electron pops back into. You'll see in the next slide that we're going to take and apply 
a negative and a positive charge. Now remember, the electrons are negative. That's the little dots with the stars. And the nucleuses are have a net positive charge. If you have 29 electrons and 29 protons, so you have 29 positive charges and 29 electrons of equal negative charge, it is electrically neutral. So these atoms are electrically neutral. However, if you apply a charge across this conductor, minus to positive, that minus over there represents excess electrons. In other words, there are electrons that have been stripped off of atoms and placed in containment. The positive is a bunch of atoms that are missing electrons. So, on the left end of this copper conductor, you have a negative charge, a negative ion, a negative force, which is attracting the protons in all of these copper atoms. Well, the copper is a solid. Those nucleuses are not going to move. This negative charge on the left side is also repelling all the electrons in this conductor over towards the right. Over on the right, you have a positive charge that's repelling all the nucleuses back towards the left, but again, it's a solid, they're not gonna move. That positive charge over there is also attracting all of those free electrons. So on the left side, you have an excess of electrons which are repelling all of those free electrons towards the right, and over on the right, you have a positive charge that's pulling them that way. So, I couldn't do it in this graphic, but basically those valence electrons, the ones with the stars on them, are basically popping in and out all the time. They're very loosely coupled, and as they become warmer, you know, the copper wire warms up, they pop in more and out. So when we look at this graphic, here we have a bunch of free electrons that are randomly popping in and out. And if we apply a charge to them, the negative pushes them over to the, to the right and the positive pulls them to the right. I want to mention that this graphic of the electrons moving through a conductor was not created by me. I added the minus and the plus charges. I got it somewhere off of the internet, but I wanted to give credit. Now this is for educational purposes, so it's okay. But you understand these free electrons, once they come, once they come under the influence of an external minus and positive electrostatic field, remember there are lines of force going from that negative charge over to that positive charge and in the middle are all these loosely coupled, coupled electrons that now take off going towards the positive. So that minus and plus could be a battery. Now if you put a wire across the two terminals of a battery, that wire is going to get really hot because you're shorting out the battery and there's too much current flow for that conductor. Speaking of batteries, we briefly, we briefly glanced at how we could displace electrons with friction and create a static charge. One thing I forgot to mention in the previous graphic, several of those graphics where we were looking at a negative and a positive ion and the lines of force between them, the charge, the electrostatic field between them, the strength of that force that's pulling the negative and the positive charge together is called the voltage. It's measured in volts and it's a specific amount of force. The closer the two charges get together, the stronger the pull and the higher the voltage. As you move the charges further apart, the field weakens because it has to emanate over a much larger volume. And so you have a weaker field and therefore a lower voltage. So voltage is how we measure electromotive force. It's an electro force that wants to motivate things to move, electromotive force. The invention of the cell, the lead acid cell, which separates electrons from atoms with a chemical reaction, was the first great invention to provide a constant source of electromotive force, EMF or voltage. By the way, this is a cell and not a battery. Battery is two or more together, such as this. This is a battery of cells. You might also use the term battery when referring to an artillery battery. One artillery unit is a cannon. A group of them is a battery 
artillery battery. So now we call cells batteries and vice versa. So everybody seems to know what they're talking about or referring to when they say a battery. But remember, a battery is actually a group of cells. So a 9 volt battery is really a 9 volt battery made up of half a dozen individual cells inside. Whereas a AAA, AA, B size, C size, D size, those are literally cells. They're not batteries. Now this particular battery of cells is what was used to power telegraph stations. So this is what powered the telegraph system. Now the way a battery works, or I should say a cell, there's a chemical process that eats away at one side of the cell and transfers negative ions over to the other side, leaving the side that it ate away from positive. Now remember, I told you that there's a force between the positive and the negative charges that's trying to pull them back together. So the chemical force pulled them apart. And in the beginning, when it first starts doing that, it's very rapid. But remember this, as it keeps pulling negative charges away and leaving it positive, the field strength between those two poles on the battery starts increasing. In other words, the voltage becomes greater and greater until at some point the pressure or the force to pull the negatives back to the positives equals that of the acid that's pulling them apart and then it stops charging. At that point, it is an equilibrium and that's the highest voltage that that cell can attain. We have a lemon, we have a piece of copper, and we have some zinc. This is a galvanized lag bolt and there's zinc in the coating and the zinc is what we need. Let's turn the meter on so we can see the voltage that's displayed. First thing we want to do is roll the lemon under pressure to kind of loosen it up inside. Then to make it a little easier to work with, let's uh, cut a little slice in there. So we can slide in the piece of copper and you see that there's nothing appearing on the meter yet. Notice we're on the DC scale and this is auto ranging. Now we need to put in the zinc. The easiest way to do that is just to screw it in and I'm going to disconnect the meter lead and put it in there then attach. And you see we have almost one volt, 0.948. Now the amount of voltage that you can generate with any combination of dissimilar metals and caustic solution, like your lead acid car battery, that has, if it's a 12 volt battery, then it has six cells. This is a cell, this is not a battery. I know they refer to it as a lemon battery, but it's not a battery. A battery is two or more like an artillery battery, battery of cannons, a 9 volt battery is truly a battery. It has six cells inside of it. Take one apart and look. So this is a cell and this was originally called a wet cell and then the devices that we call batteries like this, this is a double A AA cell, an alkaline. That's the caustic material that interacts between the two dissimilar metals in here to uh, produce a voltage. Negative on this end, positive on that end. But this is not a battery, it's a cell. They call them batteries at the store. Everybody calls them batteries. That's fine. Try to remember that this is a dry cell and this is a wet cell. And the most voltage that this can produce, no matter how big it is, is fixed based on the two dissimilar metals and the caustic solution, the alkaline. This, it's a cell or a wet cell, and the most voltage that it can produce is based on the copper, the zinc, and the acidic nature of the lemon juice. There's a maximum, period. Now a lot of people can confuse voltage with power. Voltage is not power. Voltage is a measure of pressure. So right now there's a pressure of one volt and notice that it says negative here. If I switch the leads, I disconnected that so you could see See, that minus sign is gone, which means that the zinc side is producing electrons and the copper side is a deficiency. 
of electrons. So right now there's current flowing, electrical current flowing from the zinc coated lug bolt through the black wire, through the meter, back to the red and back into the lemon. So we have a complete path for current flow. If we disconnect either lead, then you see it goes to zero. Now, if we wanted more power, we would have to either increase the voltage or increase the current flow or both. Right now the current flow is limited by the resistance, the opposition to current flow in these wires and the lemon juice itself and the bolt and the piece of copper. If we want a more current, we could take and use a larger piece of copper and a larger piece or access to more zinc. That would increase the current flow, but it would never increase the voltage. You can generate electricity with two dissimilar metals and a caustic solution. And this is proof. I'm sure you did this in high school, grade school. It's the most famous electrical project in existence. If we wanted a higher voltage, what we would do is take two lemons and put them together. Okay, see we have 0.96 volts with one cell. Now you notice I have a second one lined up here, but I haven't connected the final conductor yet. And when I do this, I'm going to connect these in parallel. And notice that what change you got. It went from 961 millivolts, thousands of a volt, to 964 millivolts. The truth of the matter is the voltage did not increase at the cells, but now you have twice the capacity to deliver current flow to the load, which is the meter. So when you put cells in parallel, in other words, we hook plus to plus, minus to minus, in parallel, the voltage doesn't increase. It's like going from a small air compressor tank to a larger one. And let's say both of these tanks, let's say you got two air compressor tanks hooked up in parallel, meaning that the uh, compressor charges both of them. If they're both charged up to 80 PSI and you connect the uh, hoses together, you still only got 80 PSI, but now you got twice the volume of air to flow at 80 PSI. Now if we wanted to increase the flow, we would hook these in series. So we would take, I'll take off this lead and I'll run this one to here and then this one to here. Oops. Not very well rehearsed. So let me kind of move the, this out of the way a little bit. Okay, so here's our two cells. We've got this hooked to the red lead on the meter. And we go from this zinc to this copper and then from this zinc to our meter lead. Now look, you see we have double the voltage. We hook these in series. In other words, we connected, we went from minus to plus, minus to plus. So the batteries are now in series, or the cells. So if you wanted a two volts, this is how you would do it. If you wanted three volts, you'd go get another lemon, another lag bolt, another piece of copper, and notice that the one side of the meter is connected to yellow, the other side is connected to red. And then we have green in between going between these two. Now it wouldn't make any difference if we swapped this all around the meter would just say minus 1.9 volts instead of there is no negative sign which means it's positive. We talked electrons. Primarily what we discussed was electrons. Now I would like to point out that all of this is somewhat subject to the imagination. You need to understand that no one has ever seen an electron. They've never seen an atom. Now people will argue that point, but remember that when you say that you can see it, that implies you can see it. Even with the aid of optics that magnify using light and refraction, you cannot see an electron, much less an atom. Now electron microscopes, 
uh, the best way to describe these devices that can see things that you can't see is that they, just like when you put light on an object, that's energy. That's electromagnetic energy, light edge. You put light on the object, the, the light interacts with the object, and it reflects light and absorbs it, refracts it, and then what reaches your eye, your brain processes and you see it. With an electron microscope, you hit the object with energy and then you have some way of recording the reaction. So you could almost say that it cast a shadow of the atom in a sense. Well, a shadow has not seen it. I can see the shadow of something, but that doesn't mean I can see it. So let's not split hairs here. No one's ever seen an atom or an electron. They're very aware of its presence. Now, the uh, model for an, for an atom has changed over the years, but it's still relatively the same. The difference between the Bohr model of an atom, where you have a nucleus, and then you have electrons rotating around it. Remember, those electrons are basically traveling, so to speak, at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. Well, if that was the case, then if you could see it, it would look like a cloud. The atom would look like one solid object, so to speak, because if it's traveling 186,000 miles per second, then all of the atoms are everywhere all at once when you put it in terms of the human eye and time, you know, anything less than a tenth of a second is pretty tough for a human being to deal with. A thousandth of a second, not a chance. Much less, you do the calculation. If something's traveling at 186,000 miles per second in a circle, in a in elliptical orbit, and this the the size of that orbit, we'll say the diameter is millions millionths of an inch. Just ask yourself, how many times can it travel around that tiny little circle in one second? At 186,000 miles per second. So we, we talked electrons. Uh, we did a little thing with the lemon to generate some electricity. And that's it for this discussion. But we're going to do some more. So let's wrap this up and go to the next one.